Wonderful God. Thank you, God. Oh, I tell you, our church are very, very creative and full of fun. Some people don't like that. That's why they're not here. That's, that's okay. And, uh, but really, I mean, if you, you, if you love fun and if you love to get in the game and, and people are just come as you are, you know, and come just as you are, and that, that, that's, that's what church is supposed to be. We just come as we are. There's no pretense. We love God. We love each other. None of us are perfect. We just enjoy the Lord and what He's done for us. Amen? Did you say hello to somebody? Just look at all these wonderful people. Great leading guys. So good. Did you read what they wrote about you? You wrote that yourself. <laughs> that was so cute. All right, give the Lord a big hand. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. So funny. What I'm just going to tell you a short story. Please don't take this personally in any way whatsoever. Don't look around. Is it okay? Everybody cool? Okay? Nobody's going to get upset about don't be sensitive. And sometimes I will say things that might, you know, Mention races or different. I'm not a racist. I love all kinds of races. Uh, I will make Chinese jokes, Indian jokes, and uh, that's okay, isn't it? Because I want you to laugh. When you laugh, you suck in oxygen. When you suck in oxygen, your brain starts to think properly. And I want a church of thinkers. Can you say amen? I don't want you to just sit there and just go dead. I want you to think what is being said every morning. Is that fair enough? Well, this overweight person, very big, large person. He saw an advertisement in the newspaper. Lose 5 kg in one week. And I know many of you are into gyms and bodybuilding and all of that. Congratulations. But guys, if you're not in a gym, that doesn't mean you're less uh, uh, valuable. It's okay. There are other ways to get healthy. Okay? Just eat less. Maybe you eat 20 M&Ms a day. Try 10. But anyway, this guy saw this ad, lose 5 kg in a week. So he calls up the company and the lady says, be ready tomorrow at 6 a.m. The next morning at 6 a.m., he opens the gym door and he finds a beautiful girl with shoes and skirt, really beautiful. And she says to him, you catch me, you kiss me. And she starts to run and he chases her and he never catches her. This goes on for a week and even though he chases her, he never catches her, but the good thing is he loses 5 kg. And he's so excited about this. He signs up for the next one. He says, you know, I'd like to lose 10 kg. She says, all right, show up tomorrow at 6 in the morning. Next morning he shows up. He's already lost 5 kg. He thinks he can catch the girl this time. So off he goes. She says, you catch me, you kiss me. And she starts running and he chases her. After an hour, he never catches her. And after a week, he loses 10 kg. Now he's all pumped. He says, look, I'm going to lose 25 kg the next time. And she says, look, that's going to be very, very tough. It's almost impossible. Are you sure you want to sign up? He says, yes, I'm going to be signing up. And so she says, all right. Next week comes, 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, come early at 6. So at 6 in the morning, he opens the door. And standing there is a 6 foot, 6 inches hulk. A big black man stares at him and says, I catch you, I kiss you. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're taking it. I, should, I could have said it's a big white man, but white men are not. All right, Galatians, Galatians chapter 1 verses 1 to 4. Many people believe that God can heal. Many people believe that God can save. But what many people don't believe or don't know is that God has healed. And that God has saved. Okay, let me explain that. You look troubled. Okay. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ. And God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you. Peace from God the Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ. 
This is the verse I want to talk about. Who gave, past tense, gave. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Paul is making a statement which many times as Christians we struggle to receive. So I'm going to be repeating some things I've said in my other messages. It might be repetitious, but until we catch what we are talking about, until we come into knowing what God has already done for us, not begging God, banging our heads, Getting a group of people to pray with you. Now, prayer is important. Don't get me wrong. But the church has come to a place where we think if we can get 100 people coming together, maybe we can put enough pressure on God and twist his arm as if he's not willing to bless us. He has already decided for you to be blessed. He has decided for you to be saved. 2,000 years ago, it was a done deal. In the scripture, the Bible says, he says, I pray, and he says, peace and grace be multiplied to you. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2, it says, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge. Everybody say knowledge. And this is our biggest problem. This is the thing that stands in our way. Grace and peace is supposed to be multiplying upon your, upon your life. Multiply. You should be in an abundance. Now, some people get offended with that. Honestly, I've, some people have talked to me recently. And they've criticized people who talk about God wants to bless. God has decided to bless you. God wants to prosper you. God wants to heal you. And these same people will say, well, that's prosperity gospel, and they'll criticize it. And I've decided I'm not going to argue with people. Because to me, and I don't, know any, I don't know everything, and I have not arrived, but to me, what you know is how you're going to live. Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will set you or make you free. When you know the truth. So to the level of your knowledge of God in Jesus Christ, grace and peace is multiplied. So if you continue to remain ignorant and you don't want to know this truth from the word of God, you're not a word person, you go by feeling, you go by what the doctor says, you go by what the economy says, you go by what traditional Christianity tells you. So people will say, you know, I mean, I'm not sure if God heals today. Maybe God put this sickness on me to teach me something. Well, if you believe that, you know there are some churches that teach that. That God wants you to be poor so that in your poverty, you can learn something from God. I don't find that consistent in the Bible. Now, the Bible does warn us about The love of money, which is the root of all evil. But it doesn't say money is evil. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is not because I just want you to prosper. I want you to prosper, and that isn't your ultimate goal. I want you to prosper to be a blessing to people. That should be our ultimate goal. But if you you can't be a blessing. So the same people who say, well, I'm not sure about this prosperity thing, they'll write letters to churches like, ours, and ask us to help them. Well, if you are sure that God doesn't want you to prosper, why ask for funds? Why borrow money? Just remain poor and die poor. If you don't believe that God wants to heal you, that you can rebuke your sickness and fight against it, if you don't know that that's what provided in the Bible for us, then why go to the doctor's? Why rebel against God if you feel that God wants you to be sick and poor and dumb and stupid? Because the Bible does teach us to fight a good fight of faith. It teaches us to resist. I want you to be a group of rebellious people, not against men, not against government, not against your parents, don't hear me wrongly. But to rebel against things that are contrary to the knowledge of the truth of God. You must say, that's a lie. That's not in the Bible. I refuse to take that. 
I rebel against that. No, not in an arrogant way with people. But you know, when people come and tell you that's the sum total of your life, you say, that's a lie. That's not me. God has called me to be the head and not the tail. Jesus Christ already provided for me all of those things. And he said, if you knew, if you knew the truth, the truth will make you free. So here, Paul tells us that God wants to, that God delivered you from this present evil world. We often think, yes, one day God will deliver me. I pray God will deliver, deliver me from demonic attacks. I pray that God will deliver me from hell. We, we think that it's somewhere in the future out there. Listen, this will help you. He says that he has delivered us. Let's go back to the scripture in Galatians. He has delivered us from this present evil world. You know, in heaven, there's no devil, there's no evil, there's no sickness, there's no fight. We fight a good fight here. We beat the enemy here. So I'm going to be talking about a few things, um, a few points that I hope we will, we will catch this. And it's like a repetition. I, I'm just going back to things that I've said to you many times. And the fact is, if you know this kind of a truth... When sickness, now sickness comes to all of us. We all go through different trials and testings. We all go through, when the world goes through a financial crisis, we all get affected. But I don't let the media and the blogs dictate to me, it's going to be very tough. I can't afford to buy it. Many of you are young people, you're planning your future. You want to buy a house, you want to own something. And the news on the radio, I heard it the other day, that properties in Malaysia has gone up in price 12%. 12 is one of the highest rates in the world compared to America. They've dropped down, and the UK dropped down a bit. Malaysia, So young people facing Malaysia, if that is your knowledge of who you are and what you can do. Now, you may not buy a big house immediately. You might buy an apartment. You might rent initially. And slowly, you will. So I teach people... The knowledge of God. Your God is not a cheapo God. Sorry, cheapo. I didn't mean it like that. God's name is not El Chipo. His name is El Shaddai. I want you to know this truth so that when people said we can't afford, you might answer this. Maybe not now, but I will be able to afford my own business, my own house, my own property. Now, I'm saying that. Some people, you see, all you preach is material wealth. I want you to be so blessed that you can honestly, like Yenny was saying just now, and I've done that. I don't like to brag about it. When I see a couple coming in and they know, hi, pastor, they come and buy makan or whatever. And most of the time, the restaurants that I go, I know the owners, so I'll just wave at the owner. So they go up to pay. And done, done deal. They come, oh no, pastor, should, we should buy for you. No, 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 I want you to know. Just because I'm a, I'm a pastor doesn't mean you have to buy me a meal. Some pastors think like that. Oh, I've got a dentist in the church. I'll go for free dental care. I'll tell the dentist, and I've got Christians, lawyers, dentists, nothing free. When I go to aunt, Uncle, Auntie Manju's place, he, he owns the restaurant. I don't go there because I'm his pastor and expect a freebie. Do you think I'm a cheap skate person? Some people behave like that. I deserve special privileges. No, I should buy you a meal. I don't care if you own it. I own you. You're my church member. I did your marriage. That's why you're prospering today. Amen. <laughs> No, I'm just saying all this stuff, guys, not to brag. I haven't arrived there yet. I still struggle. I still have to fight the same devil you fight. According to the knowledge that we have, you know the truth. The truth will make you a free person. You rebel when you have... You don't sit down and let them dictate to you. Well, this is how... Joe, your preaching is so good... But that's not how life is supposed to be. You are supposed to get depressed once in a while. That's normal. And I'm sure depression has hit me when I go through stages in life, when I'm peaking up and moving forward. 
But I refuse to stay depressed because the spirit that God has given every one of us is not the spirit of depression. The spirit that he gave us, the Bible says, and the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, joy. Again, some Christians struggle with this thing, joy. Your church, they laugh too much. They are too shallow. They are too frivolous. You are exactly right. You are deep, but I can't see your joy. But it's deep joy. <laughs> deep. Honestly, I'm not kidding you. These I deal, I deal with theologians all the time. We check out. You know, what's going on? And I refuse to argue. I, but they like to pull me in. Joe, you're very silent. Never heard from you. Okay? You ask for it. You ask for it. And I would say, what is wrong with laughter? They say, unless it is holy laughter. So now, here's my question. See, people don't think, yeah? That's why it says knowledge. Then grace and... Pre people don't think. They've got a brain, but it's just stagnant. Don't think. So I said, then who determines the level of holiness in a person's laughter? Is it ha 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 hallelujah? <laughs> Is it with a baritonish voice? Ha ha ha. That's deep. I felt the anointing there. I said, the very fact that you are a Christian and you can't laugh shows you are a bankrupt. In fact, don't go into laughter. Talk about a smile. Some Christians can't smile. They think it's wrong to smile. How do you live on this planet? You know, you should die and go home, be with Jesus. Get out of here. You stink. You can't smile. Well, you know, there's so much of suffering in the world. All right, what are you doing about it? Somebody the other day in my housing area said, Oh, we should tell the world leaders to stop doing all this terrible thing, mass destruction and mass killings and all. We should speak to the world. I said, you can't even speak to our housing development management to repair the boom gate. You want to talk to world leaders? You are... How, st <laughs> you, how stupid can you be and still breathe? I love to poke. I'm not, again, I am not, I have not arrived. I'm just like you. But I know my Bible says in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and depression. Well, Jesus taught us to pray like this. He taught us to pray. We didn't invent this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth exactly as what it is done in heaven. He taught us to pray that. Now in heaven, there is no lack. Of course, we understand that's perfection in heaven. But what he is saying to us, and once we come into this realm knowing, look, I rebel against that. In heaven, God has my riches. I don't need to wait to go up there to get it. I claim it for my needs here. I need to get a house. I need to launch my business. I need to educate my children. I need to put money aside for my daughter who's getting married. I need to expand my house. I want to build. I want to buy properties. I need those things so that I can be a blessing so that when other people come to visit me, will say, stop staying in cheap, lousy hotels. Come stay in our homes. There's plenty of room for you. Come stay with us. And I prophesy and pray that over every one of you to have that mentality. Your kingdom come. Father, bless me so that I can bless other people. A lot of our young people won't be going home for Christmas. They are here working and studying. Stella and I want to be so blessed so that we can say, kids, come on over. My home is your home. We love you. Come over. Let's have a Christmas. We'll cook you turkey. We'll put that pig on the whatever and we'll roast it. Now, I can't do that if I'm a pastor just, you know, saying, you know, just, uh, just give me a little bit so that I won't be proud, so that I'll always be dependent on you. No, I want God to give me above and beyond. 
if your dream isn't bigger than what you're having now. You know, when God gives you a dream, he scares the pants off you, honestly. Don't stop believing God for greater things in life. Can you say amen? In Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith. Everybody say by faith. Your feelings has got no equation in your walk with God, in your Christian life. Yeah, we all get emotional. We all get this and that. Excuse me. But if you're ever going to access anything from God, it's got to come by faith. So there are many times I don't feel like preaching. I don't feel like lifting my hands and praise God. I do it by faith. I just get up there and I just said, God, I praise you. I do that about most things in my life. I don't feel like doing a lot of things, but I know it's good for me, so I go out and do it. Much more the things of God, because in verse 2 it says, by whom we also have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory. We have access, we have an entrance, we have an open door, and all the things that you want from God, you are able to receive it, not by begging God, Not by saying, oh God, if you'll just be so kind to me. Oh, please help me. You hear some people praying this. You know, they they are spiritually begging God. Please, if you will answer my prayer. God doesn't treat you like that. It's an insult to God. Imagine my daughter or my grandchild comes up to me and says, Grandpa, please, I beg you. Can I please have a, a sandwich? It's an insult. Oh, I'll be very, very offended. He's your father, Jesus said. You need to know that, like experientially. We sing the songs, we talk the talk. We say the right things as Christians, but you need to come into that experience. This is my daddy I'm talking about. I have access into everything that he says I have through faith. By faith, I believe that God will provide me for that job, and God will provide me for a life partner, and God will provide me. And you walk in faith, not in arrogance, but in simple faith in God. So there are three things I want to mention, then we'll close. You and I really need to become people that understand that we all are faced against an opposition. He is the devil. He hates you. All right? So you need to be literally ruthless in your Christian faith. This will shock you. You need to get out of your, 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 your yes. We are, to, we are to demonstrate patience and kindness and gentleness. I know we should do that. And we must learn patience with each other. But I don't want you to be patient when the, doc, when the doctor tells you you've got cancer. I don't want you to be patient with cancer. You fight that thing. Right until the day you either die or you break that in Jesus' name. The same with your finances, the same with your marriage. You fight for your marriage. I know that there's this person that is doing such and such to my wife or such and such to my husband. What are you going to do? You're going to be patient? No. You've got to be violent. You've got to be violent. Okay, I'll give you scriptures for that. But anyway, number one, don't limit God. Don't limit God. The Bible tells us that the children of Israel limited God. Three times God said to them, your dreams are too small. I am a big God. But they limited God. It says in Psalm 78 verse 41, Yea, they turned their back and they tempted God and they imagined they could limit God as a limitless God. And they could limit God. Jesus would many times encourage people and he would say, look, according to your faith, and he, then the, he will just say to them, they will say, Lord, Lord, they will have mercy on me. You know, they were desperate, they were begging him. He said, according to your faith. What do you want? According to your faith. And then when they believed, he said, look, your faith has made you whole. He never took any credit for it. He said, look, according to your faith, what do you want in life? How much do you want what you want in life? So I speak to couples all the time. What do you want in your marriage? It's not the in-laws, it's not the economy, it's not the children. I speak to younger couples, and those of you who don't have children yet, try to, from the first day or first week or second week, after you've had the baby and the nursing and you're still nursing, from the start, from the start, put your kids in another room. 
Don't put them beside you, next to you, in between. Don't start something you will regret. Ten years later, come and call me for counseling. I'm telling you now. The kinds of... Never mind, that's a different subject. <laughs> I get carried away. I get carried away. But you know, a lot of your problems can be solved according to your faith. It's up to you. All right? Today, right now, some of you can experience a healing. Right now, right now. You don't have to wait for an altar call. Now, don't get me wrong. Altar calls are great, and they are important, and they are good. Some people will go to an altar call to get healed, and that's absolutely right. That's good. Because sometimes you cannot stand alone on your faith. You need somebody to support you. All right? So get me get clear about this. But some people will run from one meeting, one Benny Hinn meeting, to a, another Reynard Bonke meeting. They are sending letters everywhere, asking for other people to pray for them. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. But I pray that as we learn this truth and the knowledge of God, that over a year, you will begin to realize every time an attack comes on you, you will know how to operate and fight against it on your own. Honestly, that's the best Christian life. Not running around trying to get one thing fixed and then another fire, trying to put that fire out, asking people to help you, begging God as if God is not hearing your prayer. But that you, when you come into this knowledge that God is for you, that you will begin to know how to put out those fires and attack those enemies that attack you back and walk in that liberty that Christ has called us to be free in. Okay? Number two. Now let me stop at number one first. Please understand that 2,000 years ago, it was already done. Listen, this is how you receive it. First John chapter 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The sins of the whole world, past, present, future, Jesus died once and for all. Do you understand? But is the whole world safe? Obviously not. Because you get saved by access, by faith. You, you, you get salvation by believing and receiving Jesus into your life. That's the only way you get saved. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, verse 12, For as many as received him, he gave them the right to become the sons of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says that with your mouth you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and with your heart you believe. With your mouth you confess what your heart you believe, and that's how you get saved. So you've got to, you've got to participate in what God has already done for you. Okay, Because sometimes some people will, will think like this. If God came to me and healed me, I'll be healed. If you preach like that, or if you live like that, you will never know for sure, is God coming or is he not coming? Are you listening? If you told somebody, listen now, everybody think, look up here. If you told somebody, you can only get saved if Jesus came again and died for you. Now, how confident will anybody feel if they believe that? You know, Clangy, if, 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 if you want to receive Jesus, he will come and die for you, but you've got to really want to. You won't know. I want to, but I don't know whether he will want to or not. You understand? So Clangy believes today that Jesus did die for all 2,000 years ago. So easy for people to get saved that it was a done deal. That he did die for us. Are you following? It's the same with healing. So some people are waiting for healing. If somebody came, touch me and heal me, I'll be healed. It was done. It was done. So you're waiting for that experience, that goosebump, that, that feeling, that fall on the floor and shiver a little bit. Or, and all those things, nothing wrong with that. I know when you're touched by the power of God, man, something happens. But if you're waiting for that, if you're waiting to get a letter from your bank saying, there's $10 million in your bank, oh, now I'm prosperous. No. But if you can believe that God will prosper you, so until I see that letter from the bank, or if I, the doctor told me and declared that, why don't you believe now that God has healed you 2,000 years ago? I hope I'm coming through with that. 
All right, let's go to the second point. Don't be carnally minded. Don't be carnally minded. What does it mean? In Romans chapter 8, it says, verse 5 and 6, For they that are up to the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are up to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now listen carefully. The word carnal is your body, your flesh, your senses. It is a gift from God. What are your five senses? You're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and feeling. So to live in this world, thank God, it's a gift that God has given to us to identify with our world. We see, we taste, we feel, we smell, we touch. But when it comes to the invisible realm of God's kingdom, if you try to go by your five senses, you're dead. Are you listening? You see, in this building, there are a lot of signals going on. TV signals, this is a wireless microphone. There are signals going back to where the signal is coming to this receiver. Do you follow me? Can you see any of those signals? If you go by your senses, you can't feel it, you can't taste it, you can't see it, you can't hear it. But if you take a television, if you put it up here, and you've connected and put up the antenna, and you turn it on, you get television signals. Is that simple enough? Now, the signals didn't come when you turned the television on. The signals were already here. God is with you, never leave you. No, all he needs you is to have a receiver. I receive, I believe. I thank you, I praise you, I give you glory and honor. I trust you, Lord. He's taking a photo of me, tell me, Lord. I trust you, Lord. I thank you, I believe you. I don't see it. That's why it says to be carnally minded, you're dead. You're never going to enter into that supernatural provision of God, the healing of God, the abundance of God, because until I see my finances change, then I know God is blessing me. He's blessed you. It's going to happen. You're going to prosper. So we tithe by faith. Do you notice that our tithing and our giving in Malaysia, giving towards our building, is not tax exempted? In many Western countries, where my daughter lives in Australia, you give towards charity and churches that are helping in charity, which our church, we have orphanages and helping the poor, tax exempted. I wonder if tax exemption in those countries were removed. Will people still be just as generous? You didn't get me. I'm trying to compliment you. You are very generous people. You don't get any benefits by giving towards this church, and yet you kept on giving because you have a spirit of generosity. You are giving as unto God and not as unto men. You're not a man pleaser. You're a God pleaser. You're obedient. You think in Jesus' times they had any exemption? No, they had crosses. <laughs> they were killed. But they sold their buildings, they sold their houses, they left jobs, and they went on this wonderful, biggest dream in the whole world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. No assurance that they'll be safe. To be carnally minded is to say, I want to see first, feel first, think first, and then I will really trust God. Jesus said, my word is spirit and they are truth and they are life. You don't see the effects of the word. I want you to be a word people. Amen? All right. Can I just shock you again? One more thing just to shock you. Stop trying to change God. I repeat that. Stop trying to change God. It's better you change. You can never change God. The Lord is very clear. Malachi 3 verse 6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. Some people feel if they begged God enough, if they did this, they did that, then maybe God will... No. Jesus is the same. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want you to grow up and even grow older well. Why not? They put there in the Bible. I, I just read the Bible. That's it. 
Moses was 120 years old and his eyes were not dim and his strength did not fail him. He climbed Mount Nebo, which is a high mountain. He climbed when he was 120 years old. Here we have 40 old people, they're talking like great grand. They're sitting down and sighing all the time. Hey, how are you? <sighs> 40 years old. Now those things are in the Bible. I'm just saying. People lived well. They lived long. So all I'm saying is that get into what the word of God is saying. Because people today, they are panic. They are, they are, they are reasons to panic all the time. The Zika virus has come to Malaysia. And so people are panicking. I'm not saying be stupid. I'm saying you need to make a declaration. This is what I declare. Exodus chapter 15 verse 26. And if you will diligently listen to the voice of God and you will do what is right in his sight, and if you hear his commandments and give and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases. Everybody say none of these. None of this rubbish shall come upon you, he said. He said none of these diseases which I brought on the Egyptians. I am the Lord that heals you. I'm Jehovah Rophekah. I choose to believe that. Again, let me say I'm not immune, neither are any of us immune to what's happening in the world. Don't be stupid, don't do stupid things. But when they come, you've got to be a rebel. I didn't say if they come, when they come, you've got to be a rebel. So I declare, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Final point, number three. Don't misunderstand the sovereignty of God. Many Christians say, God is sovereign. What do you mean by that? Let me give you the definition from the dictionary. As a noun, sovereign means a ruler, a monarch, a crown head, an overlord. As an adjective, sovereign means supreme. Absolute, unlimited, unrestricted, unbounded, unconditional. All that describes God. He is absolute that, but more than that. When he comes, when it comes to you and I, don't use, well, God is sovereign. Maybe he wants me to have that. Otherwise, he won't give us scriptures like James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he... If God is sovereign about everything, he could have resisted the devil for you. He didn't need you to do it. And yet, he tells you, you resist the devil. Whatever you bind, help me, you, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Where two or three agree on anything, it's done. Are you getting this knowledge? Into yes, God is sovereign but not over everything in our lives. He gave us that same anointing that was on Jesus Christ. That's why you're called Christian. The word Christ means anointed. So while we are here on earth, for example, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, listen to this. God is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish. So God doesn't want anybody to perish. And yet people are perishing. I mean, he's sovereign. Because Jesus said in Matthew 7 verse 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many people go there. Why doesn't God just sovereignly stop everybody from going to hell? He's a sovereign God. So don't misunderstand the sovereignty of God. In Isaiah 26, he says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Guys, listen. Focus. Don't lose focus. You, there are things you got to do. There are things you got to call out. You got to fight. You've got to take charge. Matthew 11, verse 12. I'll close with this. It says, heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. There is a fight 
where you have got to become in your spirit, not with, again, please, not with your husband, not with your wife, not with your parents. Don't get aggro with people. But there ought to be such a, a holy hatred towards things that go wrong in our world where we come for prayer and we say, God, we come against this. We hate this injustice. Okay, I said no more scriptures, but I'll just give you one more. Promise. It's all these people giving announcements that took so long to deliver. My preaching time is gone. I'll try to cut this. No, I'm joking. You guys were fantastic. Listen, this is what it says in Ephesians chapter 4. Be angry. The Bible gives you permission to be angry. But don't sin. That means don't get angry with people. Don't get hateful towards people. But he says, be angry, but don't sin. And he says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That doesn't mean that God says, it's okay to get angry when it's daytime. Nighttime, don't get angry. Actually, it says, the verse is connected to, and don't give place to the devil. There's got to come something inside of you where you are not so cool, where you begin to get really aggro about what the enemy does in people's lives, or even in your life. I had enough, I'm rebelling against it. Again, please, it's not against people. Sometimes when I see things, it disturbs me. I get really angry. And it's okay to get angry. The other day, somebody posted something of, I think two guys walking past this little boy on the ground. I didn't want to watch it. I didn't even watch it. But my wife watched it and told me, which made, it, made me more angry. And this little boy was on the ground, and two people just beat him up for nothing. Honestly. Sometimes, now I'm your pastor. I'm not a man of violence at all. I hate confrontations. I hate fights, quarreling. I, I'm not a fighter. I'm a lover. <laughs> I don't like fighting. I don't like... Con I'm, I can't fight. But every once in a while, when I hear stories like this, I said to my wife, sometimes I pray, God, give me that one chance to be there. And give me the same strength you gave David. Just, take, just give me one shot. One shot. Please. No, I tell you, it really... I will, I will decimate. I don't care if I go to jail. I don't care. I don't care. I, I may go to jail. You're going to hell. It really, when I see a child, a child, an innocent child being beaten by these people, or woman being beaten by a man slapping her around, it's just not normal. There's something inside of us triggers against that. Jesus got angry when he walked into his father's house and he saw how the poor were treated and these people were gambling and no regard for God's house. He didn't say, blessed are the poor in spirit for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and speak badly. No, he made a cord of whips and he beat the black out of those people he tanned them, he whipped them through tables and chairs. If I did that in, in church, I'll, I'll lose my job. And I won't. But Jesus did that. This is not an excuse for us to get angry with people. But you need to come to a place in your life where you say, this joblessness is really making me angry. I should not sit down and be a bum. I'm called to be a ruler. I will have my job. I will send out more resumes. I will make more phone, phone calls. I will knock on more doors. You don't sit in your room and say, all of you, please pray for me. I'm not going to be hungry. I'm going to be a person who buys other people meals. And I'm going to tell other people, don't sit in your room and be depressed. Come on, we can get a job. There's somebody, some... There's some business out there created just for you. Just for you. Just watch out. Make those calls. And suddenly, because you accessed it by faith, you began to become violent 
with your own failure in your own life and said, I'm not taking it. This is not heaven. This is not what God has. I'm a child of God. But if I ever cross a, a, an incident that there I saw violence, I will forget for that moment. I will pray a prayer. God, I hate this. Now give me strength as you gave David. And let me take this guy. I don't care how big he is. I'm not a fighter. But I, will, I, I cannot take that. It's one of... Abusing children is one of the things that really wrecks me, you know, and uh, I wish I could do more. But God has called every one of you to start taking charge of your own life and start putting it. Now, we do pray for people, please don't misunderstand me, but wouldn't it be great if as a church we understood the knowledge of God and peace and grace started multiplying, not, not just a little grace for this trial and little grace just to go through this problem, but multiplied grace and peace comes upon you and you glorify God in your life. Stand together. Sorry for keeping you so long, but I loved you. I wanted to keep you longer. <laughs> well, I only preached half an hour, didn't I? Very good, about 40 minutes now. Amen. Lift your hands right where you are. Don't be shy. Lift your hands to God. Sign of dependency on God. Father, prosper your people. Thank you for giving all that we ever desired. You loved us so much that you gave us your only son, Jesus Christ. Die for us. Rise from the dead. We want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for healing. Thank you for deliverance. Thank you for some of the prayers that are going to be answered. Maybe not right now, but in time to come, we are not going to give up. We will fight. We'll keep moving forward, pushing forward. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Everybody just start opening your mouth and thanking Him right where you are. Come on now, everyone, everyone. Everyone's got a mouth. Thank God that you have a mouth. Open your mouth. Use it now for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Everybody, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, let this place be filled with praises. Let the singers sing, but you just worship God. That's right, you keep worshiping God. I'm going to worship When my spirit is soaring I'm going to say that's just positive confession no it's a declaration of the word of God speak the words very simple God this is what you said this is what I believe and speak it over your life right now some of you need jobs promotions some of you need prayers uh, that you for a long time you've been concerned about maybe about your family maybe about health I want you to start declaring it I'm thanking you that you are Jehovah Rapha. None of these diseases will come upon me. 
you need to tell all those sicknesses when you know that they said might come upon you your parents had this your auntie died of that your mother got into that by the age of 39 and now you're only 35 in four years time you're going to succumb you need to rebel against that in the name of Jesus you need to say I reject that's not coming upon my family you say that stops with me when I have children they are going to be blessed everything stops here it's not going to happen so as far as I'm concerned I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus so my children and my children's children and our generation will be blessed we cannot say well that's how my father was that's what they had no idea of this truth that's why the Bible says through the knowledge of God grace and peace is multiplied so I want us to lift our hands right now cancel some of those things that have been spoken over your life in the name of Jesus we cancel every negative word spoken upon generations of children of parents the words that have been spoken through school teachers our people who have been above us in our lives that have said that we will lack and we will not be able to do well in life we cancel every negative word that has been spoken over the people of our church that they will be healthy they will be strong they will be joyful that the fruit of the spirit will be their spirit their spirit will be joy peace love long suffering in the name of Jesus every single one to come under the word of God the sound of my voice in the name of Jesus we declare you to be blessed can somebody say amen, amen. amen. God bless you